Ah, yeah, okay. There you go. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Matomo, for helping us with the technical issues. And as I was saying, uh, welcome everybody for today's talk. I'm very happy to host you here. Unfortunately, we had some issues with the link that was sent earlier, but we managed to get it uh, out in time. And most of you who followed us from Facebook and WhatsApp, I hope you, I, I know you got a, a proper link. Um, I would like to again welcome you all and welcome to our speaker, Lisbeth Kukemur, uh, who's currently um, at Oxford University, one of the best universities in the world. However, I must mention that uh, Lisbeth is our sister. She's, uh, she's from here in South Africa. Um, she did her PhD at Stellenbosch University under Professor Strauss on some proteomics work. And thereafter, she left to UCT, where she did um, a stint as a postdoc there, trying to help the drug discovery group there. I think it's under Kelly Shibale. Yeah. And she was setting up, uh, working on a tuberculosis group, where she was setting up some enzymology um, assays in order for them to study anti-tuberculosis. And uh, thereafter, she moved to Oxford University, where she joined Professor Frank von Delft, I know Frank very well through my friend and colleague, Dr. or rather Professor Lizelle Piata from University of Johannesburg. Frank is a very world-renowned crystallograph, protein crystallographer who's doing wonderful work. A very interesting guy to speak to. Uh, Lisbeth, I know you are very, very lucky to work under this guy, but you know Frank can keep you the whole day talking about different things, experimental setup. You know, I miss those conversations with him. So today, uh, Lisbeth is going to talk about uh, developing antiviral through open source science. This project, they call it a COVID moonshot. And then this project is very essential for our understanding because some people were complaining uh, that it seems like um, the, starting from the vaccine, the medicines that are coming in are coming too fast. And then they don't understand what it goes behind developing such medicine. So we thought it would be necessary for us to use this uh, uh, um, platform or this talk to sort of help people to understand what goes behind developing something that is called a medicine, especially now that we're faced with this pandemic, something against COVID. So uh, we must also mention upfront that we are very grateful for our government to participate in the global vaccine initiative. We have the first batch of vaccine, which was delivered in South Africa this week. We are looking forward to be vaccinated. However, uh, as we know, there are still skeptics of, of vaccines. And then with projects like this coming with alternatives, uh, it will also be helpful. But this is not going to replace the vaccine. The vaccine is still the best option that we have. So, but this will only allow us to understand what goes behind uh, medicine development because some of us will go to the pharmacy, we get uh, over the shelf medicine or prescription, but we don't know how and what goes behind the research that leads to, to, to a medicine. So before I give the platform to our speaker, I would request everybody that they keep their, their uh, mic muted and the videos off so that we can get a uh, better coverage. Uh, Lisbeth, the floor is yours and thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Edwin, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. So I think the first thing I need to say today is that this is not the University of Oxford project. This is very much a global initiative. And as I go through the story, you'll understand why I say that. Um, the slide I have here is we tried Last year, to have, we had a webinar and we tried to make a slide to thank you if all the people who were involved. And we realized there's always the situation where you leave out somebody's name. So then we rather filled in the world map with everyone's names. So if we accidentally left somebody out, they can just think maybe the name was too small, they couldn't see it. But in any case, we are based on this little island somewhere here. As Edwin said, I'm at Oxford University, which is famous for a lot of things, good and bad. Um, the building you see here is the Radcliffe Library. Just behind here, some of the scenes from Harry Potter was shot. Um, just on the other side of the road is the Cecil John Rhodes statue that had to fall. Um, I'm on medical campus, so of course we're not in the pretty part. We're out in the very more 
modern glass um, green building, literally green. And in most of Frank's group is actually based at Diamond Light Source, which is in a small town 50 kilometers away from Oxford. So we're a bit spread all over the place. Now, the first thing you need to know about the British society is Brits are known to be very polite, very stiff upper lip, and they're also very politically correct. So when I showed the poster to my lab on Monday, they were a bit upset. So I have to start off this talk to say what is this is not about. And um, Edwin actually did point it out very well. So this is not the anti-vax talk. We firmly believe that vaccination is essential and that we need all the tools in our toolkit if we're going to um, beat COVID-19. And then we also said we're talking about alternative therapies. So I just want to point out, I'm not talking about some of the other homeopathic natural other therapies that came up in the last year, like PCG vaccine, vitamin D, melatonin, zinc, sunlight, or even Donald Trump's famous bleach statement. So what is this talk about? And this Edwin also pointed out is, I'm just gonna tell you a bit about the story of how we are trying to develop antiviral. Now, if you look at this graph here, this is a picture people normally use to tell you, look how difficult drug discovery is. You've got all these stages you need to go through from discovery, identifying the target, developing assays, validating, through preclinical stuff, which is all the safety, solubility, does it work in a mouse model, rat model, monkey model, whatever model is relevant. All the clinical trials, that is the most familiar ones, which are normally in the news, and then all the regulation stuff. And then, of course, as you can see, this is normally on an extremely long time scale. So my story today focuses on these first two stages. And I'm also going to try to tell you how we're trying to fit this into a one year time frame, which is a bit insane, but um, bear with me. Now, of course, at this stage, it'd be good to mention that there is actually SARS-CoV-2 antivirals being tested already. Um, you would all have heard about remdesivir, which was the first antiviral approved for um, COVID-19 treatment. There are at the moment two compounds in clinical trials that were developed for um, COVID-19. And then there's two compounds that has been um, repurposed. So they've got, they are in the clinic already, but for totally different applications, and they were found to be also uh, antivirals, but now of course they need to go through all the safety testing as antivirals again. So I need to backtrack a little bit now with my story and go back to the virus that caused um, COVID-19. So the virus, this is a nice artistic depiction of it. And all I actually want to show you in here is you can see the RNA in it is like this long coil. I always think this looks like a snake and freaks me out a bit, but this is the long coil. Now, when you get sick with the virus, this RNA gets translated and expressed into this extremely long, what we call a polyprotein. So it does all these different proteins linked together into this one strand. And this needs to be cut up into the smaller units to get the active enzymes for the activity. Now, the two enzymes that act as the scissors is two cysteine proteases. So one is called PL-PRO, and the other one is called M-PRO, or main protease. And we've shown in this description of just where the, where the cut sites are. So you can see PL-PRO with the pink triangles have three cut sites, and M-PRO with the purple triangles is actually the one that does most of the protein cleavage. Now, before I go on to what we've done with Impro, I need to just backtrack a little bit to methodology just to make sure we're all on the same page. So our group is known for fragment-based drug discovery. So basically what we do is we look at enzymes in a crystal form. Now, if you look at my picture, the enzyme would be this blue and um, purple block or this drug target in the bottom. Now, in traditional drug discovery, what we normally do is we take a library of compounds, and that can be from anywhere. It can be a synthetic library, it can be a natural project product library, it can be a Chinese medicine library. And we take this library and we test it against our target and we see which ones work. Now, most of the compounds in, the in nature is quite biggish, quite complex, and for a drug, it, it normally needs a certain amount of complexity to work. So if we find a drug that works, and oftentimes when you go back to the actual crystal structure, we will see if this is the drug, this is a crystal, 
Yes, it works. Yes, it binds. But you can see the binding. There's room for improvement. But if the drug works, then we don't really care. We continue. Now, what we do is we take it from the other side. We start off with the crystal and we say, let's use a few fragments, small, big, small molecules, and let's see if we can just probe these interactions. So if we look at our block analogy, let's probe and let's see which things actually fit this site the best. And that will give the tightest binding. Now, these things aren't drugs, but if we start adding them together, we might get a block that will actually fit better than this block, and then hopefully act better and be a better medicine than this one. And just to show you a bit of a lab slide how we do this, we normally have this plate like this. So all the different colored dots you see are different compounds and all the, all the spaces in between which you can't see is actually just colorless compounds. And we add them to crystals. Now crystals in our case is not like the ones you grow from sugar or something. It's really, really small. So and we also have them in plates, so one of these plates would easily have 96 times three um, drops of crystals. Uh, there's a nice piece of picture of a drop there, that tiny thing there where the red pointer is the crystal. And we are able to put in a compound in very small nanoliter scale next to the crystal without destroying it. We let this interact for a while, then we take it to synchrotron. As you can see, beautiful, massive robots this is really something to see if you ever come to the UK. This is impressive. And then with a lot of data management, we managed to visualize our enzyme crystals. So this is actually MPRO. And then all these colored sticks and stuff in there is where the compounds would bind. So that part there is actually the active site, the part we're interested in. Now, how did it start? So according to Wikipedia, COVID-19 was born, if you can say virus is born, on the 9th of November 2018. We'll see if they actually just keep to that timeline after the inquisition they're doing now. MPRO, the main proteasis structure, was solved in January 26th of last year by a group in Shanghai. Um, they reached out to us and asked if we wanted to do something with the crystal structure. So it came over to Diamond. On Valentine's Day last year, we managed to clone and produce the enzyme at Diamond. A few days later, on the 20th of February, we had our first structure solved. Five days later, a group in Israel, um, under near London, did the same type of fragment screen that we did, but they did it with mass spec as another technique, not crystallography, and they identified the first hits. Diamond on the 5th of March has collected 1,500 crystals, which they were to analyze. Now, I know if you're not in crystallography, you won't actually understand how crazy and insane this is, but this is really a lot of crystals in a really, really short time span. And then two weeks later, we had a public data release. So normally if you get do crystallography, it is like any peer-reviewed process. You get your data, you have to clean it up, you have to build your model, you have to make sure that it meets a lot of check and balances. You deposit it to a database, they proofread it, they check if they agree with it, and then they only release it to the public. But because of the pandemic looming, because of all the lockdowns coming into place, as you can see, we've got, I've got a lockdown date here for South Africa. We decided we can't wait until it's gone for peer review. We are just going to do a public web release. And this was the public web release that was done. Just saying, here is the data, please use it. And then after that, we went through the whole peer review process and this data is now published. So all of this is good. This was the insane time scale, a lot of work. But at this stage of the process, it's like, so what? We've got this data, this is not a drug. What does this benefit the large society out there? And this is where all the big PIs started talking to each other. And then they said, but if we go back and we take into account that drug, we've got all these little fragments, can we start merging them together to a compound like that? Okay, now let's keep ahead again. And this is what this is. Can we something, if we merge those fragments together, get a drug? And then can it be a good, safe antiviral? How are we going to find it? And can we do it in a public forum? And this is when they started talking. And apparently they said a conversation went like this, that near London from the Weizmann Institute said, 
Yeah, let's just ask Derek Lowe to broadcast in his blog, and maybe we can get a, people can give us smile strings in a Google Doc. Now, Derek Lowe writes a blog that's called In the Pipeline, which is all about drug discovery. And I just want to say I'm very glad we didn't get a Google Doc with smile strings in it. So then Alpha Lee from Postera said, but his company can build a website that can do all of that, which was the better solution. If anyone is wondering, Google's not the way. Um, and then John Cadera from Sloan Catering said, but if we've got all these um, molecule ideas, somehow we will need to rank them and see which ones are actually the more important ones to make. And he will use Folding at Home to do that. Now, Folding at Home is a computational system where you can donate your computer CPU when you're not using your computer. And then people can run, use that to run modulations and all of the computer things they want to do with it. And then, of course, this is my boss, um, Frank, came in and it's like, great, if you guys tell us what compounds and you give it to us, then we will test it. And this, so they decided to pull the grant, grant funds, get a few philanthropic um, aid, and the project which we know as COVID Moonshot was born. And it is ambitious. The ambition was to discover a preclinical candidate um, for Impro within 12 months in an open source environment. And as I remember the slide previously, I told you that that is normally a four to seven year process. What we had and have been, um, yeah, what benefited us, what other people don't normally have, is with the world going into lockdown, we also had a lot of really clever people from both academia and from at home who now had time to actually do this kind of side projects. So we had this worldwide pool of human creativity that we could tap into. And that is what is the main driver that's making this, uh, made this project so successful so far. So now, Postera kept to the word. They built a web page. So what people could see back then is they got this um, access form. They could fill in the structure that they wanted or the compo designed, fill in their name, all of this. On the next page, they would be asked their rationale and why they think this is a good thing. A lot of our advertising actually happened through Twitter for some reason. So we just got the message out there and we started getting designs in. And from there, we followed what is basically a nice three-step circular process. We get our designs, we design which ones to synthesize, then we test them, get those results, feed back to design, and go round and round and round. Now, from the beginning, oh yeah, we had two main players in this. The one is the community, which from where we source the original designs, but it's also a group of med chemists that could actually just look at them and tell us what is valid, what is not valid. And the med chemists for, in this stage of the project is really important because they're the ones now doing the SIR for us and deciding how to tweak the molecules. On the other side of the circle, we've got Enamine, who we've um, approach to ask us to do all the synthesis for us. So Enamine has been a key role player in getting the compounds to us. We also took all three of these blocks and we actually broke it up into three different projects. So the design project was a, we call the virtual project and that's where we throw in all our crazy ideas, everything people think of, that goes into that block. The synthesis designs are the one, are all the compounds that we've evaluated from here and we can see oh, we can actually make this, this will make sense to test, we can synthesize this, we should go forward with these compounds. That goes into the synthesis block. But now, of course, anyone who's a chemist will know you can have a molecule in your mind, but actually getting it made is quite a different story. So our last project to test one is all the projects, uh, molecules that actually manage to be synthesized and shipped to us, and that is the ones that goes into all the biological testing. And in about two slides time, I will spend more time on the testing of the molecules. Now another, yeah. In between that, we are very heavily reliant on a few databases. So Postera runs most of the background infrastructure for us and is a lot, lot of the admin. CDD Vault made their product available for us to us for free. And this is where we upload all our biological acid data. It's also integrated stats package, so most of our IC50s, everything gets plotted in there. People just give their raw data to us. And then because 
it's open source, so we always want people to know what's going on. We've got open platforms for GitHub, Postera, and a pro um, pro um, program called Fragalysis, where we show people what what are we are doing, keeping them up to date with our results at all times. And the last thing I want to show on this slide, I just want to give you an idea of just about the admin that goes behind. Because a lot of times we always look at the science and we always look at what the results of the science was, but we kind of forget that there's a lot of stuff that has to go on the background to make the science to work. So in our case here, as soon as we get the science, just how it's been presented to us needs to be standardized and we need to check for duplicates and we need to check for feasibility. Just because you can draw something on a piece of paper doesn't mean it can ever exist in reality. Going from design to synthesis is all the computational and scoring work and docking and seeing will it work, is the, what does the AI say, and also prioritizing. If we can't make every single compound that we get, um, even ask where we are, we don't have enough money to do that and we definitely don't have enough time to test them. In the mean, it's not only synthesizing our compounds, but they're also the key keeper of all the information about how things were synthesized, the synthetic roots, what, how they optimized it. And some one of the valuable roles for us that they also play is they are the holder of our compounds. So all the compound logistics happens for them. So if I decide today I want to do a mouse study in China, then I phone in a mean and say, can you send me X grams of this compound to China and it's their problem to get it there and it's their problem to find the stocks to make it. I don't, we don't have to worry about it from our side. And then from synthesis to testing, it's a lot of making sure that the people in testing labs have the right information. Do they have the right test maps? Do they have the right stereochemical information? <clears throat> Is it in a format that they actually use? Because a lot of our programmer people on the top and our testing people in bottom, in a sense, use different ways of describing stuff. Name their files different, like spaces, don't like spaces, a lot of complicated little details that you never know about until you're there. And then lastly, after it's tested, we have to report back to the community. So we need to pull data out of CDD, which is a more closed format to the public forums of Postera and GitHub and Fragalysis. And then we also discuss our failures and our successes on blog forums and on blog posts and a lot on Twitter. So don't worry too much about the slide, but this is just once again, just iterating all the infrastructure of technology and computing and dissemination that we need in the background for this to run. Whew. Okay. So, I'm going to jump from here to the more interesting stuff, which is the science side. So my next slide is really, really busy. Don't worry about trying to get the detail. I'll point out exactly what I want you to see. And the one thing I just want to, you to see, the first thing is, it's complicated. Um, when we get compounds, synthesized compounds in, in this block in here, and we name, normally get it every Friday of every week, we send all those compounds immediately to three different assays. So um, to the X-ray crystallography and into two biochemical assays. The one is a plate-based fluorescence assay and the other one is a mass spec-based assay. We used to, until the beginning of the year, send everything for NMR, but their funding has now run out, so they can't help us anymore. And in the early stages, we also used to do threshold solubility until we established what um, series we were working with. Now, going from the first round of screening, it's really easy. We've got very clear defined cutoffs, and we know that if our compound meets any of this criteria, then immediately which, which assay or which follow-up do we need to trigger? And this part of the, um, up until this part of the cascade is actually really easy. Um, our clinician can sit at her desk, pull up the figures, and make a list of compounds, send it to enemy, and it'll be sent out. From Basically, the viral assays down in this cascade. Things get a bit more hazy, and you, we need a lot more people with experience to actually analyze it. Um, one of the main reasons being for that is that because this is an open source project, it also means we don't have dedicated labs that we work with. And for cytotoxin itself, we have seven different labs that offer their services to us. 
And for viral assays, we had six different labs with seven different assays that offered their services. Now, the problem with six or seven different labs is it's six or seven different outputs, six or seven different sets of caveats. Um, different viral assays means you read, you get different values from it, and you can trust some of them more than you can trust others. Some of the noise is more data is more noisy than some of the other um, data, and things are not always directly correlatable or easily correlatable as we want. But having said that, I need to just say how extremely grateful we are for all these labs that offer these services, even if it was only to run one plate of compounds for us. Um, we would not have been able to do what we've been doing without them. And yeah, from there on, then it's just going for all the PK, PD stuff, which we're all learning as we go along. Now, I thought the easiest way to do this is from now on just to take one compound and just to follow this compound through the process. So this is the, was for a long time our forerunner, and this is our, basically what our lead series looks like. This compound is named MAT, BOSS, and some string of letters that we normally ignore. And when we talk about it, we will probably say MAT, BOSS, one. The MAT, BOSS is an indicator of who the person was who created the compound first. So this is Matt Robinson. And POS is the institution that he works at, so he works for Postera, which is the company that's doing a lot of the background stuff for us. Now, this compound didn't come into the pipeline looking like this. This compound's great, great, great grandfather, I think of it, was a set of fragments from our original fragment screen. And the guy at Oxford University called Triffin took these fragments and he said, but if I merge it, so again, that word merge, then I can build up a compound that looks like this. And this compound's name is Tri-Uni, a lot of stuff, six. Now, if we go further up in Tri-Uni's family tree, so there's Tri-Uni again. Tri-Uni was actually submitted to us to make on the 17th of March. So that was right in the beginning when we kicked off this process. And it took us 57 days to get from oh, this is a structure on paper to this is the IC50 value for it. And the reason it was so long is because this was where we had all our teething problems. We were figuring things out. The assets were still being optimized. All of that stuff that you don't think about. Then for a long time, we forgot about dry uni, so about 40 days, until somebody else is like, hey, let's just stick a ring up here. And then we got ADA UCB. You can see we improved a little bit in speed, not a yeah, we basically halved this time to 30 days from structure on paper to IC50. And all of a sudden we are below one micromolar. So we're in a nanomolar range. So we, this is getting exciting. Um, still a little bit of a delay. Stick another ring on here in the bottom. And we got half drop in potency, which is at this range really impressive. But now I can also see we've realized there's something going on here because all of a sudden the follow-up compound happens a lot quicker. And here we get to our little compound, MATPOS1, the one that we're following. Now MATPOS1, if I start from the very beginning, was ordered on the 10th of September of last year. So basically six months after we started the project. We got it on the 22nd, or it was shipped on the 22nd, so it probably arrived at us three day, two days later. And down here, we track it very specifically on what shipment dates, a whole lot of um, other information of batch codes, catalog numbers that we assigned to it. So it was part of shipment 25. So as I said, we get a shipment every week. So shipment 25 would be week 25 of the shipments that we got. And then Matt goes, goes into the first round of screening that I showed you. So we send it to the biochemical assays and we're quite happy with it. It's really potent. We send it for a crystal structure. So this is the other tool I've been telling you about for galaxies. This is the how we look at our crystal structures and we can see, look, it's nicely bound. There's Matt, there's a crystal structure, it's bound. We are happy. And we send it for NMR and the NMR also says it binds. So this was just the harder value, the more chance likelihood of binding is. 
So if we use the traffic light system, this is definitely a green go. Yes, we're happy. So MET1 gets sent into the next range of assays. So the first thing we do is start the docs. So you don't, what you need to see is that you don't see anything here, which means is a good sign because that means there's no effect on it, there's no side to So once again, we're happy, MAT1 is a go ahead. Then we get into viral assays. And remember I told you a bit earlier, because we have a lot of labs doing viral assays, the data all looks different. And some of it is a bit messy, some of it is more clear cut. And even you can't really see the values, but you can see this one basically says inactive, while this one says highly active. So a bit of variation over it, but if we take three out of the four assays, it says that we have an active compound. So we are happy. On a traffic light system, this is more orange, but we are happy we can go ahead with this. And then we take MATPOS, took MATPOS into further profiling. One of the main reasons this one got went into further profiling because this was now our poster child. So we want to see how that he does. And if we know how he does, we kind of have an idea of what his kids would look like. But it also gives the med gamers clear indications of what do they need to tweak, how do they need to change the structure, what are we aiming for. So first thing we did solubility. We did two types of solubility tests, which the med chemists are just moderately happy with. This is we want a bit more higher solubility. We did a target engagement assay, which is a cell-based assay basically just saying, does it interact with Impro or not, which we didn't get a signal out of, which is a worrying sign, except at this stage, there's a, there's not, yeah, there's a lot of things we can explain why that assay is maybe not as robust as it should be. We sent it for metabolic stability and clearance, so testing in hepatocytes and microsomes. And if you lose, read the T halves here, this is how long in minutes it takes to eliminate half the compound. So you can see this three minutes is really quick. So it leaves the body way too quickly, and this is just putting it in a um, intrinsic clearance um, value. So metabolic stability, it's not stable enough at all. It gets cleared out way too quickly. So our med chemists know already, they need to work on this, they need to change this. We sent it for protein selectivity. So basically what this is, we tested it against 53 other known human proteases that would be a problem if this was a drug. And our compound interact with any of them, so it's a clean profile and we're extremely happy. We didn't expect that to be that good. We send it for permeability. So permeability is the ability to go over the cell wall, which might also have been one of the reasons the target engagement wasn't happy. But the permeability was good, so that's not a problem. And we wanted to check if it binds to the plasma, so one of the and, and maybe it's not available to act, but we see that in the plasma binding assays, we still have 12% free. So that's also a high amount available. We wanted to take it for rat exposure, just to see if the compound's available, if we want to go into animal models, but we had formulation issues, which probably links back to the solubility. So that was basically where this profiling stopped. Yeah, and I said, I don't even think we were thinking of efficacy, but with this, these two red line dots, we could definitely not go into efficacy. But the good thing is, as I said, Matt is the poster child. So we've been doing a lot of follow-up SIR studies on this. And this list I'm showing you today is just a sample of this week's shipment of compounds, which all basically built onto the sca scaffolds and has been tweaking it to work with all the metabolic problems we were having with the first compound. Now, where are we for today? Today we have, if I jump to the last column, we had over 15,954 molecules that were submitted to us to evaluate. We synthesized and tested, so it's at least gone through the first tier of three tests, 1,697 molecules, and we released 258 crystal structures, which is also a lot. Um, as for the computing resources, we are, are already on sprint five and a half. It's probably now most close to the finish of sprint six of all the modeling and AI we've been doing. And we actually on the side also ran a GoFundMe campaign in which we raised $54,000. Um, so 
as I said, for acknowledgements, this is a worldwide um, collaboration. We've got a few people in Britain, a lot in America. We've got Enemin in the Ukraine. We've got somewhere in China, Fubushi, um, near London in Israel. So this is really a global global project. And that makes always telecons also very fun because everyone's in a different time zone. And then we have written up what we're doing in a bioarchive preprint, which is available if you Google it. And this is also at this moment the most complete list of names of a head of everyone who's on the project. And that is me for today. Thank you, Thank for, you for, for that for wonderful, that wonderful talk, talk, Lisbon. Lisbon. Uh, I'm, uh, very I'm very happy. I'm ready to seeing uh, some, some of the hands, hands going, going up. up. Yeah, yeah. It, it really goes to show that if you are on the side of technology, you are, you are lucky, uh, basically looking at the fact that um, you guys work as a group also, it's also helpful. You have uh, multidisciplinary uh, people working on this project and then it fastens things. So I'm happy that you managed to show that, that um, the strength in numbers. So, but still, um, I hope there's going to be a lot of questions with regard to these uh, timelines that uh, just within a year, you have already a drug. So that's actually uh, something that you're gonna have to find someone to manage it well, to convince the masses that indeed this drug can be regarded as something that is effective. So I'm going to open up the questions um, and the discussion around it. Um, I do see some hands up. I actually see one hand up, which is Dr. Angela Harrison. Uh, Angela, you, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Lizzie. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It, it was really, really great. Um, and incredibly fast. Um, I have a background in, in drug discovery, especially um, fragment-based and small molecule drug discovery. Um, my specialty was in HIV. And um, interestingly enough, the, the molecules that you um, are showing um, just previous to the one that came in at shipment 25, um, they look remarkably similar to an integrase inhibitor that um, we were, were testing on. Um, I have a couple of questions. When you're in your, your drug discovery pathway with the fragment-based um, drug design, um, how often do you ever go to your molecules and just change out one um, component? Like I noticed chlorine in all of the structures, um, changing it out to a fluorine. Um, reason I'm asking is we often found that that was very helpful when it came to solubility of the drug and it didn't tend to have that much impact um, as far as the binding was concerned and um, IC50 and EC50 ranges. Um, and then secondly, the other thing I just wanted to ask, um, what your view or your opinion is on drug repurposing versus fragment-based drug design. So um, drug repurposing, obviously it has the advantages with um, it's already been clinically trialed as far as safety and solubility and that kind of thing is concerned. Um, and it's a lot quicker to market. Um, but like I say, even even that model of, of doing it um, is somewhat longer than the model you guys have managed to, to do at the moment. So that's really something very much, uh, you know, really, really remarkable. But um, yeah, if you could just give your, your opinion on drug repurposing versus fragment-based uh, drug discovery. Okay, so I'll first go for the chlorine one. So what I haven't shown here and what our med chemists do a lot, and we sit for it every single week, is they will have the molecule, and then they will really have that chlorine moved around the ring. And they have made molecules where it's on multiple positions, and they have molecules where they swap it out with fluor or bromine or so they, we are actually looking at a full set of SAR, swapping things out. The last slides they showed us this week was actually showing us all the options and then the log P and then what uh, they will think will happen with the efficacy if they do that. Um, that's of course a bit boring to show in a quick presentation, but um, the med chemist we have on it is, and this is not again sounding like we're going to brag, but this is old AstraZeneca, old Pfizer people. So this. We have people in here with 
a lot of experience of how to do that. And in that case, we're really, really lucky because we are just fragment-based drug, yeah, we're crystallographers. We, we bit of this, and I think when Frank said, yes, oh, we will test it, he didn't actually realize what we will test it means and how <laughs> much things there are. Um, on the other side, so we've got a close to preclinical candidate, but we're not there yet. Um, we're not really, um, our potency isn't really, really strong enough yet. And our clearance isn't really, really strong enough yet. So even if we get to our, um, in our year framework, we get to our clinical candidate, then we are stuck at and now we need to do the upscaling of the synthesis. Um, or we won't do it. We'll need to find someone who can do that. And then, of course, go into the clinical trials, which need to be planned, which is, I think, going to add a lot of time to it. Where in that mm -hmm. case, the repurposing is a bit easier just because they already have that in place. They can already make the drug in large volumes and they, know they have the distribution methods. Um, I think in the, my main opinion is, I don't think there's really a, we're not in a race, it's not who's gonna win and who's gonna get there first. Although with the vaccines, it did feel like that way. I think it's just, we need a lot of options and it would be good if we work and we'll be great and we'll be happy, but we'll be just as happy as one of, if one of the repurposing drugs work, or we'll be just as happy as one of the two clinical drugs work. Just because, yeah, we're not in it for, um, say for the glory, that sounds a bit weird, but mm -hmm. we really just want to see something work and we want, we all I want to be out of lockdown, to be actually quite honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's lockdown about the patient, not about, yeah, I understand. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, thank you, Angela, and thank you for your answers, Lisbon. I'm going to move to the next uh, person who wants to ask a question. Is Anza Chiri Zirama Burana? Anza, your hand is up. I'm not sure if her hand was up by mistake. Um, I'm going to ask a question before Lizal Piata. <laughs> Um, how about if there's someone here right now who's a chemist and mm -hmm. then they also think they have a molecule that they've synthesized or they think it can act as a good inhibitor for this enzyme. What is the procedure of them getting, in, getting involved in this project? So... I'll, okay, the procedure up until now, I don't think it's changed, is the best thing is to actually just email us and tell us, hey, we're in, we're interested, we think this. Um, the reason I say that is just so we can get a bit of a background, because you're telling me, oh, I've got a molecule that works, it's like, yes, so. But if I talk to you, then you can tell me, but listen, I've looked at the structure, I've known, looked at all the viral data out there, and what I know is that this type of interaction works, that type of thing. We still take on our posterior website, molecule, people can still submit molecules, it will still get a name. And if the rationale is there, if you can convince with your rationale for the MedChem team, then we will take it through the process. We did that with, I think, three or four um, different people last year, where they would come to us and say, they've got this series, can they partner with us? with the idea that they will then, if this series work, go out and start writing grants and trying to get money um, in that way. So yes, we're still open for collab for ideas. We're still open um, to test other molecules. We have this pipeline that is now running, so it's very easy to drop in one or two molecules into a, the pipeline. And although we're very convinced in our molecule, always, always, everyone tells us to be cautious that until you've crossed the finishing line, you don't know that this is the winning molecule. So it's always good to have this backups in also to keep that in mind, if I can say it like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Piata, you are next. Hi, Lisbeth, thank you for an excellent presentation. And it's really nice to see fundamental biochemistry in action as well. So uh, you alluded a little bit to that. So I think the obvious question would be, um, now what about these variants? And and um, obviously the variance is in the spike protein, but you guys are going for a protease. So 
I guess that would make it even more attractive. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would. But now for, so yes, from a biochemical point of view, yes, we are bypassing the spike, so it's fine. Go, coming now for building a clinical case for an investigational new drug, we now have to actually not just test against SARS-CoV-2, the uh, wild type one, we also now have to show, oh, but it is still active against the South African variant, the UK variant, the Brazilian variant, can't think of there's another one at this moment. So that was also one of the things I probably didn't point out is that since we started the project until now, a lot of things have shifted in what is important. So when we started in the beginning of last year, we've only had the wild type virus and everyone said ferrets is the model you need to test in. Now, nine months down the line, nobody actually knows what animal model, but we'll go for the one we can afford type of situation. But now it's what's become more and more important is, is it active against the variants? And do you have pan-coronavirus activity? So does it not just hit SARS-CoV-2, but does it hit the other coronaviruses out there also? So in that case... Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Mm. Okay. Thank you, uh, Lizelle. Are you satisfied? Okay. More than, moving... sorry. Sorry, just okay. struggled with my microphone. More than, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm moving from one professor to another professor. <laughs> this is another uh, biochemistry professor, Professor Ed Moshonai. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madara, and thank you, um, Lisbeth, for a very great presentation. I, I came in very late, so I must apologize first. Uh, but nonetheless, I enjoyed the talk. Um, to be honest, I'm just asking a very basic question with respect to this virus. I, I've been in lockdown. I have no clue what is going on. Um, how much of this virus do we know? So I understand the genome is out. Mm. Is, that, is that translated to protein? How much of the proteome do we know? And, and, um, and, and because I, I think eventually are we just settling for protease and, uh, and reverse transcription? Is there more to this virus from a proteomics point of view? Because I think perhaps it's a good thing to have more proteins to target. Maybe it's also a good thing to have less to target so that we could be more focused. So I don't know your opinion about that. About that. Thank you. Uh, I'll share my screen. Is my screen still shared? There we go. Uh, do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So we know that it translates into this one long polyprotein. And everything that is marked here, so there's names in the bottom, but in the top it's um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, till 16. They call it NSPs. I can't remember what it stands for, but that's the different proteins that they know of in the virus. And there's actually a lot, quite a few projects out there that targets a different ones of them. Our project started with MPRO because that was, I think, the first crystal structure that was out there. It is the first crystal structure that we got a really good um, fragment screens on, and that's the one that we pushed forward. But at this moment, there's also an active um, project for ML PL Pro. I know there's one for NSP13, there's one for NSP15, there's one for NSP16. There's an area that they call the macro domain that I'm not exactly sure where it is now, that they're also actively doing. And then I can't speak about all the international groups. So no, we're not focusing our, our efforts on one protein per se. Um, in our group or in our environment at least, because there's at least five projects that I know of, and then internationally there's a lot more going on. Thank you, Lisbon. Um, as I've already mentioned, it's just a string, a string of professors um, in waiting here. So I'm now moving to another professor who's a virologist by training. This is Pascal Besson. Well, thank you. Thank you, Edwin. And thank you, Liz. Uh, Lisbeth, I hope I pronounced it correctly. That's fine. <laughs> uh, um, thank you so much. It's quite, it's, quite, it's quite extensive and it's really packed. 
um, I think you've shown you've shown a different a different approach, you know, in terms of drug discovery, mm-hmm. where things which uh, for myself I find it very, I would say, um, educative, and there are many aspects that are quite are quite um, are quite informative and in a way adding emphasis in terms of the pipeline. Um, I like I like the slide that you showed in terms of how things move from step to step to step, you know, step to step, and the timeline, because you know, most of us need to know that and be reminded of that several times because we don't have um, always a good idea of how much work goes into this type of things and uh, how intense is it, intense the focus and in bringing something out. Of course, the lay person will just feel that, well, it is out, I need to get it and use it. So I guess as some of us on this forum, if we know the whole scenario, how this thing evolves, I guess it's also also useful for us who at times have to speak to the community, hear the lay people who ask questions, which are very good for them to be able to make their own informed decisions. Um, my question is is uh, is that. Uh, and the molecule which we are taking forward is an mm-hmm. antiprotease. And I was just curious how specific it is in terms of, of its relation to the other viral proteases. In this case, HIV perhaps. And I'm sensitive because a molecule tomorrow may also have use, you know, for other pandemics in terms of repurposing, as we saw at the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2, uh, yeah. uh, uh, I would say, outbreak. So thank you very much. My background is, is in molecular virology. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, if you want to test it against HIV, you can. Um, that's not something we're focusing on. So as you see, we've got quite a lot we have to do, and there is a lot of times we need to remind ourselves to focus. So, and... Also, I have to add, none of us on our team actually were virologists to start with, or I don't think anyone has actually worked with virology drugs before. So we bring in a lot of human expertise, a lot of um, antibacterial expertise, and about the antiviral protein we're learning as we go along. So that's one of the things we've been trying to do from the beginning was try to reach out to as many people in the right expertise fields that we know and just talk to them and just get their input on a lot of this stuff. Okay, Liz. Mm. Thank you you very much. Okay. Thank you, Pascal. Um, I I also want to ask two questions, but I'm going to ask them independently. If there are other people who also want to ask questions, you don't have to be a professor to ask a question, (laughs) and then you don't have to show your face. You can just ask questions. Um, you can raise up your hand, we'll recognize you. If, you. if if your question, you think you're going to not say it better, we'll help you to structure it better. So don't be afraid to ask questions, please. Uh, but now, Lisbeth, uh, there's a lot of conspiracies going around in terms of antivirals. Uh, I, I remember one big person who was pushing these conspiracies was Donald Trump. He spoke about some anti-malarial compound. Now Mm -hmm. in South Africa, we are hearing about this other drug, a a vermectin or something like that, which uh, is anti-parasitic. Yeah, it's a veterinary drug and it's being repurposed for being an antiviral. My question is, you guys with all this expertise, don't you also think that it's also your responsibility as scientists to put light into this, because here you are uh, showing this drug, which is very promising, we're very happy, we're waiting for it, but also to allay these conspiracies with testing, I mean, it will take you a day, according to what you have told us here. (laughs) Uh, If a a message comes out and says, Oxford University or this moonshot project says, uh, if a mectin does not work, at least that can help the situation. Because at this moment in time, someone who's not even a scientist comes up and say, this drug works. And everybody, because we are so desperate, we follow. And you come now with this 
thoroughly done scientific uh, drug, we, we, we question it that it took too short to produce. And then how, how can you help us with that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I don't know about evimectin, um, because I don't think that has really reached here yet, but I know the feline one, the, so there's a cat coronavirus drug that actually did make it here and that is in the in the pipeline and that's been tested. The problem with that is with the antimalarial, okay, the antimalarial is fine because it's been gone for human tox, but if the parasitic one or if the feline one works against the coronavirus in a lab condition, then we're still very much in the beginning of that whole pipeline. Um, then we still have to go through all the safety stuff for humans, all the um, selectivity stuff for humans. And that actually gets more than what just one day's work in the end. And it's going to sound bad, but you, as a scientist, you'll realize that you're very careful about what you say because the fact that the public will take it and just run with it. So if I can say, oh, but we've tested it and it is active against the virus, then everyone will say, okay, let's use it. They've said it. But we've only said it's active against the virus. We haven't said it's safe for human consumption. Mm. No, I hear, I hear you are, it's a very well-constructed diplo diplomatic answer. <laughs> <Big> answer. <laughs> it's <was> diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you are, you are, you are right there. And um, as I've already said, professors are on fire today. I have another professor who has raised up his hand, is Professor Amido Sami, who's also a microbiologist. Amido. Sami, you can go ahead if you can hear us. Uh, I think Sami is corresponding some problems. Uh, can I have Adele Berger, please, Dr. Berger? If you have a question, you can go ahead. Hi, Dr. Madala, thank you. Um, Dr. Kukumo, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, we are all based here at University of Venda. Um, so I've got a question. I don't know too much about crystallography. I am interested in protein biochemistry. As far as I understand, producing crystals is tremendously difficult and reproducibility comes into question. How have you found this? Because your timeline is exceptional. Um, how, I, I'm not entirely sure how to phrase this, but how, how you know, yeah, have you experienced yeah. problems with, 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 with regards to reproducibility? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's a good question. So, um, We've okay, so the first thing is that makes it a lot easier. We've got robots, that's gonna sound stupid, but we've got robots, so we can literally screen thousands of conditions in a time frame where if I'm back in South Africa, I would be able to set up 96 crystal conditions, and that's it, and then I'm done for the day, I'm to tie it. Um, I think in another case, we with Impro, we were lucky in a sense that the crystals are reproducible. If you've got the right prep, then it's fine. Our reproducibility problems actually came in with the enzyme prep. So with Impro being a protease that normally has to cleave itself out of the polyprotein, there's a lot of issues that comes with it starting to cleave stuff or it's tag off before it's purified or things like that, if you get a biochemistry side of it. And then also for protein biochemistry, you understand this, that enzyme is just crazy. It loses activity after a day. It is very specific on what ions it likes and it doesn't like and what reducing agent it likes and doesn't like. So we had more issues trying to figure that out than we actually had in getting a stable crystal system. Right, thank you. Uh, it's, it's an endless story of <laughs> proteins. Yeah, it's activity. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Adele. And Lisbeth, uh, maybe I should go for my last question if there's no any other question. Uh, my last question will be, actually I have two, but my first question of the last two is about the way you, you are a South African. You were trained in South Africa, now you're operating at UK. 
Now, the, the difference in sciences, in approaches, because one other thing that we, we as scientists in the country have been questioned to, 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 to answer whether, what are we doing about this thing? What are we doing about this pandemic? What are we doing with these viruses? Do you think the South African science, as you compare it to the UK science, is matured enough that universities like ours, or even the best of the best in Africa, like UCT, Stellenbosch, Tekis, VET, are they at the position where you think they can compete globally in also participating or coming up with projects like this? And if not, what do you think in your own experience, personal experience now, should be improved so that we can also participate in projects like this? That's going to be a bit of a slow philosophical answer. Um, I don't think South African scientists need to stand back. Um, we've got a running joke in our lab that if Frank wants something to be sorted out, he'll ask one of the South Africans to do it because we can troubleshoot. If we don't have something, we can try to make something. If we don't have a chemical, we can try to distill it. We are used to this tougher scientific environment, if I can put it like that, and we know how to plan around it or how to troubleshoot or how to make some um, contingency plan, which is a really good um, thing to have. And just on South African science, we found it extremely amazing, and we've spoken about it a lot, that the SARS-CoV-2 mutant was first identified in South Africa in, in December. The fact that South African sequencing facilities were up there, they did it quickly, and I understood it's actually because of all the years of HIV research we had to do. Before the UK found a variant, before India or whoever Yeshua should, there should be mutants in found it, that is just actually amazing. And we're actually hating it that we call it a South African variant because they make it sound like we're the bad guys. We're actually really good guys because we found it so quickly and now they know about it. Um, and I mean, most of the South African scientists I've worked with are amazing people. I think in a big case, which makes South Africa a bit more difficult is the fact that stuff is more, basic science is a bit more difficult. If I need a compound now, I can place an order with Merck now and it'll be in our lab tomorrow morning where I know everyone else struggles with supply and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I know from talking with the people at Stellenbosch is the load of teaching and admin that is in all of the South African professors is high. Where, where I'm now, we don't teach. Frank, Frank teaches in UJ more than he teaches in Oxford. Um, so we have just more of that freedom to explore, to think, to do things with a little bit, especially from the postdoctoral side, a little bit less admin that we need to do. Um, and then of course, because we're in the same time, close to everyone, collaboration is really a bit easier. But I think as South Africans, if we can just collaborate in a way that the UK, people in the UK and America collaborate with each other, we don't have to stand back. We have, we definitely have the brain power to do it. We have the power that people that can think critically enough to do it. It's just having to overcome that other unique barriers that the people here don't have. And then, of course, if you say you're at Oxford, you do get money a little bit easier than when you say you're yes. the University of Venda. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, now, maybe then I should close with this question because I don't see any hand. I know amongst our... Um, Participant here, Lisbeth, we're very grateful for this participant. And I must say again, I thank you, everybody. There's a lot of scientists who are here, whom I know very well, they're very eager to participate in projects like this. And as you know very well, we suffer uh, financial problems, uh, some projects. Instead, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard their projects, money which were kept aside for projects uh, related to COVID. But if you see what people are doing, they're actually not bringing any solution. So I thought 
probably it would be best for scientists like uh, my, 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 my boss here who's an enzymologist, Dr. Berger who's a protein biochemist, Professor Traore who's a microbiologist, Dr. Williams, who I'm seeing her here, who's also a virologist. I can go on and on with these names. Everywhere I go, I'm seeing scientists. I'm seeing Dr. Harrison. Now I'm also seeing Dr. Tugizimana. These are all scientists. Who needs help? So I was thinking that how about you also go back to the moonshot uh, people and tell them that South Africans are eager to join in. But of course, they before we send our compound to you, we need to at least know what we are, what compound we are having, what it can do. Is it possible that through your collaboration, we can also be given access to this project, for instance, through things like such as recombinant protein uh, constructs for this protease so that we can bring it in our lab, express it, work on it in many different ways at which we are trained to do. At least we can participate positively in that way because even to get a protein synthesized into a vector, it requires a lot of money. Yeah. So if if you guys can sit there and tell us if you want a recombinant protein for uh, this protease, we, are, we can give it to you and we can develop our own, own assay here. I know so many people who work on plants, some of the plants, we can isolate some compounds, we can synthesize some compounds, try to see what we are, we are getting so that when we send you these compounds, we at least know and have done it in our laboratory. Is that something that is possible? So, so the, the answer to this, we are open source. We have to share... Okay, that sounds bad, but we have to share our vectors. If someone asks us for the expression vector for MPRO, we can't keep it back because that is against the nature of being open source, open science. We just actually need you to approach us and to talk to us because just like you don't know what's out there, we, we don't know what's out there and what you guys want to do or can do until you actually just start a conversation. And I mean, as... You pointed out, Frank loves talking, and yes. we love talking to people. <laughs> and that is the one thing that I've actually come to really appreciate in the UK science, is they expect you to ask questions and they expect you to come up with weird ideas and expect you to talk, and we'll figure it out later. But as soon as you just start and just frame your question, frame your idea, even if you don't have a fully-fledged idea, and just ask. Everyone here is quite happy if you just ask. That's, that's so nice to hear. Uh, I can't see people's faces, but I know with that answer, I can already see a lot of smiles going around. <laughs> Pascal Besson will be smiling. Uh, Ed Mosh and I can't wait to get this uh, protein into his cells and express it. Adele can't wait to purify it. Safi Traore has some <laughs> plans that she wants to, to look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, I think I wanted to close, but Dr. Harrison is back. I'm only going to give her less than a minute, please. I can do less than a minute. That's fine. <laughs> I just wanted to say for everybody that actually is on the call, especially with regards to drug discovery, the European and the American market is so open to sharing what they have. They are not, like I feel South Africa can be quite closed and they want to do it first and it's quite a closed community that they want to hold on to their items. But in America and in Europe, they are more than happy to share vectors, to share drug compounds that they are studying. Mm. Um, it's really about reaching out. When you read a journal article and you see that publisher, email them. His email is always on there and you'd be surprised at the response that you actually get for them to share things with you. So definitely, in my opinion, I agree with Lizbeth. She, uh, you know, they, it's so open. The opportunities are out there. It's about reaching out and, and talking. Thank you, That's Angela, for, thank you, Angela, for also stating that. Uh, with that, um, Lizbeth, it was such a wonderful experience to have you around. Uh, we really appreciate the work you are doing. We are very proud of you. You are presenting us very well. And then with that, uh, please send my regards to Frank. And then I think there's one of my former master students there, Mpoma Kola, if yeah. you have met her. She did no, master's she with me. She's yeah. a bench is behind mine. <laughs> oh, send my regards to her. Okay. And then, yeah. So we really, we're really, really, really grateful. Oh, Pascal is back. <laughs> I can't close this meeting. Pascal. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think he's gone again. So... 
With that, I close this meeting and thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank Prof. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Ndadi Madala. Arali Bwamunna. Ndadi Bwamadala. Ndadi Bwamadala. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, Pascal. I know you are writing an email already. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch up later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fine, Taka. Thank you. Ah, uh, Lizelle, I must thank you. I must thank you. Thank you so much. Now you're most welcome. We we'll keep it up. Look yes, forward man. to next week. Yes, thank you. Bye, Dr. Madonna. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, Togi! Is Lizelle gone mm -hmm. already? Yeah, Lizelle, she's still here. No, I'm here. Hi, Lizelle. Hi, Lizelle. How are you? Hi, Miss Sutu. How are you? <laughs> Professor George. <laughs> Hello, Fidel. Hi, Miss. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are really onto some serious signs now, eh? Ah, we, we are. <laughs> Uh, uh, Amazon, don't use this platform to, to, to replace your airtime. You must buy phone airtime and talk to Lizelle because I can see the UJ uh, uh, gang is, is using, is using this platform for free. Lizelle, where's Professor Mebom today? No, he's here. He sat with me, but he didn't have a question. How come? I, I don't sure know. <laughs> Oh, no, that looks like a chloro what, what, what. <laughs> I don't know, whatever comment. But I, here he comes. I, I do have a question, though, Edwin. Yes. We're still on recording, though. We're still on recording, though. Uh, that's fine. My remove, question is, how are you doing? Yeah, remove the recording, Munna. No, I'm doing well. Uh, Rutendo, I think you can dismiss the recording, please. <laughs>